in the official notice that we can kick off. Um, so my name is Ben Strick. Uh, just for starters, I have an Australian accent and I try and talk really quickly so that I can get as much into these sessions as possible. If I'm talking quickly, throw your spanner up and just tell me to slow down a little bit. Um, I try and throw out as many case studies in these sessions, tools and data sources as well to make it as useful as possible. Um, I'm also going to tweet out most of the tools and data sources, so if you're there scratching notes wildly and trying to take photos, don't worry, I'll make sure it's all publicly available and online so you can track it. Um, great. This is the only ego slide. Don't worry, I'm not going to bash on about myself too much. Um, actually, I lie. The same one is at the end, but hopefully you want to take photos of the end one, not this one. Great. So now that the Google ads are over, uh, we'll crack on. Um, I always like to put a disclaimer in these, so I know some of you might be new to these sorts of concepts, but uh, most of my life I work with very, very horrible footage and horrible incidents. Um, so I'm not going to show you cats and dogs as, as examples of this, but rather we're going to be looking at Ukraine, and obviously there's not very nice stuff in here. So I've made as best of an effort as possible to blur out the footage, to stop footage where there's certain things happening and things like that. Um, but I will just say that some of the things that we do talk about are a little bit triggering. Great, so just to be a little bit productive in this session, because I'm aware I've got your brains for the next 40 to 50 minutes, um, I just want to cover what will this session cover. So first of all, how did we get here? So how am I in front of you? How is this open source intelligence here? We've actually got a few open source wizards in the back of the room. They usually linger, trying to be a little bit shy, um, and a couple of belling cutters as well. So it's kind of cool. So if you're trying to build out newsrooms, go to them. I'll point them out. You can recruit them. Um, so how did we get here? We're going to cover that. We're also going to look at how does this look like in an investigation? So it's cool for me to talk about tools like sundials and data scraping, but how does it look? in storytelling. And I always like to think of these investigative journalism principles that all of us want to answer, right? Where did it happen? When did it happen? Who is responsible? And what happened? Now, I won't say that open source is a magical cure or calamine lotion to cure every itch, but it can help and go a little bit of a way to help you in investigative journalism and storytelling. Uh, and also, the risk of open source intelligence, because it's not always great. Um, and last but not least, we're going to look at what data and tools we have access to and obviously something I tell my teams all the time, why is this important? Great. Um, so a little bit before I sort of cover this, uh, so I work with an NGO for the Centre for Information Resilience. Um, I'm a Bellingcat contributor as well. I used to be with BBC, so BBC Africa Eye, um, specifically using open source investigative techniques to document areas that we couldn't necessarily reach to and verify information and investigate things, especially where the government doesn't want you to know what happens. So thinking about that, um, I took that sort of as aspect to work with an NGO that, we, uh, that, that I'm a director of investigations of, and that NGO I met with a, a small group of about four to five people, and that was two and a half years ago, and now we're about 130, um, just to kind of show the rapid expansion of open source intelligence. Uh, we have more than 60 investigators that work on Myanmar, um, Ethiopia, Afghanistan. We have witness projects that document and verify human rights abuses. And obviously, it was a no-brainer for us uh, in December, actually, 2021, when Russian forces started to move towards the border. Um, we'd been working on Ukraine prior to that as well. So this is not a new thing for many of you who are already working in this space and are used to looking at these sorts of things. We've been working on this since 2014 independently, but this is when the real surge of data actually happened. Um, I want to refer two characters to you just to kind of explain the space that we're in. So the first one I think many of you probably know is Marie Colvin on the far left there. And, and there's Marie um, on the side of a, of, a, of a mountain in Chechnya in 1999. Uh, banging out a message over a satellite phone that's going to be broadcasted in a radio, uh, a radio uh, uh, and, and print as well. And she's broadcasting battle messages, essentially. That's her newsroom. That's the way she got information out and how we found out about what's happening in Chechnya. Now, if we look at da uh, Dasha from 2022 in Ukraine, she's a volunteer with the Ukrainian military, and she has in her an object in her hands. It's able to film shoot, record, and broadcast to billions of people on the spot. And she's a civilian as well. 
every single civilian is able to use this sort of technology. And so, my gosh, we have a lot of data out there. How do we deal with it? Well, that's open source information. Um, you may have heard it as open source intelligence, open source investigations. Uh, I like to refer to it as open source intelligence, but, you know, cat, dog, fish, whatever you want to call it. Um, obviously, there's a lot of different types of open source information and publicly available information. So we have news outlets. Social media is kind of cool these days. Um, we also have things such as dating applications and running applications, if you're a Strava user or anything like that. And obviously satellite imagery, which newsrooms love at the moment. Good satellite image goes a long way. Um, and we have search engines as well. Uh, don't look at stalks again. Um, cool. So, oh gosh, my battery's running out. Um, so I've, I've shown you those kind of sources as well, but I want to talk a little bit about the community because I'm only here for 45 minutes, but the community of people that we have here that are constantly developing tools, making new tools, putting out geolocations on Twitter. If you have a look at hashtag Sedan and you have a type in geolocation as a little word, you're probably going to get all that verified footage that you don't have to rely upon some nerd in the newsroom, right? So these sorts of things are quite useful and there is an ever-growing community on Twitter, which is, yeah, okay. Um, but there's an ever-growing community on Twitter, which is really useful for that sort of information. And obviously that contributes to the OSINT landscape, which is the tools that we have to bottleneck this information down, and that was developed by Bellingcat. Great, so um, hands up anyone, don't be ashamed, hands up anyone here that's Googled Ukraine over the past year or two? Anyone? Yeah, okay, some new people to the fold, welcome. Um, great, so you're not the only ones. Actually, that's Google Trends, if you haven't used that tool before. It indicates Google searches. Uh, that's a Google Trends image over the past five years, since 2018, um, with a significant spike. Does anyone know when that spike might have been? Yeah, February, late February, full-scale invasion, something like that happened, yeah. Right, moving on from that, that little point there, Let's have a look at open source intelligence. Has anyone Googled open source intelligence recently? Yeah, probably no one. Oh, great, you're not interested. No, damn. Um, so there's a significant spike there and an increased interest since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine because there is that much footage coming out. People want to know what's happening in occupied areas. People want to know what's happening to their homes, their schools, their family, right? And if we continue on from that, another interesting trend, disinformation. Who's the threat actor that we're looking at here? Google search trends. This is why I wanted to make this presentation for you guys, because all three of these together have a nice little output since February 2022. Great, so getting into this, how does this look like in an investigation? Um, I'm gonna cover a couple of stories, but first of all, I wanna talk about visualizing information, and specifically about identifying where it happened. Obviously, we can look at Ukraine, that's one point, but we can drill down a little bit closer into the details of the data. And I'm gonna talk about mapping Russia's invasion of Ukraine, full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022. And specifically, what we're looking at here is a map that you can look on your phones right now, like Dasha would, which is the Eyes on Russia map. And there's a team of communities that got together since February 2022 to work on archiving and verifying all of that information together that's happening in Ukraine. And this is really working to geolocate and chronolocate every single bit of information. As of last week, we hit 10,000 videos and photos on this. They're not only paid people. This is Bellingcat, this is CIR, our NGO. This is other organizations, including U Ukrainian organizations but also volunteers on Twitter. For example, a group called GeoConfirmed, which is about 20 to 30 volunteers that are just mad geolocators for free. Um, and this basically is information that's publicly available at your fingertips, right? So I'm gonna go into a little bit of this because it's a great way to visualize what's happening in Ukraine to the full extent. So this actually started, this map started in December 2021. Uh, when we identified Russian forces building up towards the border of Ukraine. And Russia was out there saying, ha-ha, this is just military exercises. No need to fear. And these are all of these videos emerging on, funnily enough, TikTok um, in Western Russia. So a lot of farmers like TikTok and kids as well. Uh, and what we're seeing is military assets on the backs of trains moving towards that border there, right? So that kind of impending sense of doom. 
So we started to collect this in a spreadsheet. For those of you that like spreadsheets, this is kind of a cool one. Um, yeah, the colours at the top are kind of interesting. Don't look at that. Um, you can see sometimes we're activists even though we deal with data. Uh, but basically we started to log this information in a spreadsheet, right? A spreadsheet is good for note taking and all of us like to get dirty in the sheets. So moving on a little bit more from that, what we're able to do is to build visualisations that work with showing that full scale invasion since December 2021 right up until two hours ago when the last geolocation was made. Yes, they're working as we watch this. They've probably got this on a little tab if it's live streaming and still on Google Earth right now, which is cool. Um, so that's a great way to visualise this data, right? 10,000 data points, human-coded data, great way to visualise this information. Um, and you're probably thinking as newsrooms, how on earth do we do this ourselves? Well, you don't have to. Uh, so if we go forward a little bit more, I'm going to take you into these data points and what this is. And I like to use the analogy of baking cakes um, does anyone like making cakes here? Yeah, okay, everyone likes eating them, probably not making them. So when you make a cake, you've got to go down to the shop, you've got to get the ingredients, but then you also need to look at a recipe, right? So if I provide you with one of these data points, well, that's just a cake, but your boss is probably going to ask you, hey, man, I employed you to make cakes, you need to make this yourself. So what we do is we link to the original media, and we also link to the coordinates as well so that you can find out how we actually got it. And that's about the transparency of open source. A lot of people think, you know, cool, you rip a video from Telegram, put it on Twitter, hashtag OSINT, cool. But it's not really like that, actually. It's about being transparent in the findings, right? Providing the cake, providing the recipe and the ingredients so that anyone can replicate it. And I'm going to take you through an example from Chernihiv in March 3, which is a very horrible bombing that happened. Um, and killed more than 40 people. This is a dash cam video uh, from Chernihiv, uh, warning in the next, uh, in six seconds, you're going to see uh, an airstrike. That's what we saw uploaded on Telegram. And our immediate reaction is, this is important to archive, this is important to verify straight away and get it on Twitter as soon as it's been uploaded, within the hour it happened. It's important to do that because when we first geolocated this, and it's pretty easy geolocation, I think anyone can do this one, but when we first saw this, we thought, okay, what are we seeing? So I'll slow that down in frame rates for you. We're seeing these objects fall down from the sky. It's not just one, it's two, it's about seven or eight of these objects. I'll pop them in red boxes there, because in OSINT we like to do red boxes to point things out. Um, Funnily enough, when we posted this image about an hour after it happened, we got a heap of comments saying, actually, no, they're just birds. Uh, so there you go, the trolls are kicking in already, the propaganda machine's kicking in already to start denying content as soon as it comes out. Let me tell you, if those are birds, I don't want to go outside ever again, because they're very explosive birds. Um, so first of all, what do we do? Okay, well, to fight against that disinformation, we need to answer, first of all, where did it happen? So looking at where it happened, obviously street signs are a good thing. If you see a McDonald's and you know it's London, it's probably somewhere. Um, on this one, we have a little sign saying Godenya on the right there. And we knew it was in Chernihiv, so we went straight to uh, Godenya search results for Chernihiv and we were able to identify this street corner right here. Um, and that street corner on Google Street View is kind of cool uh, because we see this little house. I've actually got a laser pointer here. Oh, it doesn't work on the screen. We see this little house in the back right there and it's got lots of chimneys, probably too many chimneys for one house to be honest, uh, but keep that in your back of your brain. We go back to this original image and we can see this one with chimneys as well, right? So we can have a perfect match to say, okay, well, we know the location. That's where it happened. But there's a little bit more than we can derive from just location and if you're a news agency deriving this out, you're probably relying on reports, but you can also get some other original information, such as having a look in the area as to perhaps what else might we can, uh, can we find out. For example, the dash cam video shows a vehicle driving down this street, indicated in the green arrow, towards that large apartment building. And this is the apartment building that we saw get struck here. Footage from the aftermath of the event actually shows that large gaping hole in the side of that apartment building. This is a very large area, and I want to show you the full extent of this area, just to show you the level of damage that those bombs had on that specific area. 
I should include that there's a hospital area near there. There's also a kindergarten near there as well. And more than 40 people were killed. Um, great. So we're able to verify that information. We're able to say that's an apartment building. We're able to show footage of the after effect to show where that happens. And each one of these dots on this map has followed that exact same process to locate exactly where it is which is kind of impressive when you think about it, and that's really a community-led event. Um, obviously, this has been important for the news as well, which is great, and we provide all of this data to news uh, agencies who want to report on this. So, for example, um, we have Washington Post. They did a TikTok video on the right. I think they thought it was a good idea to get an influence up to talk about verification, but that's cool. Um, there's Greenpeace in the middle at the top there, which looks at uh, where nuclear, um, nuclear power plants are, uh, took the data and found out activity near nuclear power plants. So that's a really great one. We can see down the bottom uh, right, uh, which is a, a map that was actually created by um, New Statesman on targeting of infrastructure power sites. So specifically where power sites had occurred and that trend of increase over power sites, that Russian strategic value to target power strikes, uh, power sites in the build up to winter in Ukraine. You asked us to check if this is a real Oh, yeah. Ignore him. We don't want to hear that. No offence to him if he's listening. Um, cool. So this is actually a report that we released uh, two days ago as well through Sky News, looking at uh, kindergartens, schools, and educational facilities that had been targeted as well, um, and really trying to verify every single one of those places that had been targeted. This is a small kindergarten. We're able to analyse that satellite imagery to look at that as well. And you can see how valuable this data is. For example, we're able to start pulling out statistics, right? Here's Donetsk. We have 181 schools that have been targeted. Kharkiv, 74. Kherson, 20, uh, uh, 36 as well, right? So it's kind of useful, this community value. It's not just about making a pretty map. It's about getting data, statistics, and trends to create valid storytelling that makes it interesting to keep Ukraine alive in the news headlines. So having a look at when it happened, um, and I'm going to take you through a case study that we worked on around Butcher, which I'm sure many of you that work in this space are very, very well aware of. Um, so if you're not aware of what happened in Butcher, there are some serious human rights abuses that were reported to have occurred there from bodies in basements, mass graves, bodies identified on the streets as well. The interesting thing is, and the reason why I want to use this to explain how we find out when something occurred is because actually the Russian government gave it a crack as well. Um, so I fast forward, this is a collaboration we did with Vice on this one. And these are the sorts of photos we were seeing. So hands tied behind their back on this specific street. And this video was, was a very interesting one. I think some of you would have seen this or most of you that work in this Ukraine space would have seen this one video. I'm not going to show the whole thing. But this is essentially when Ukrainian forces entered after Butcher was occupied and you can see the bodies on the streets. I'm not going to play too much of that, but that's essentially that. So the community kicked into overdrive and basically started to geolocate every bit of information knowing full well that this is going to be a deniable event. Again, that strategic value of Russia to start denying anything where there's a mass atrocity happening. And if we have a look at this, actually this was one released by New York Times. It was satellite imagery uh, of that specific street that you saw. This is satellite imagery from February 28. And this is satellite imagery from March 19. And this is really important to indicate and look at that value of identifying when something occurred. When bodies appear during a time when Russia occupies a specific area, there's probably one specific person to look at, especially when we have photos of those bodies on the ground, handcuffed with bullets in their heads as what we saw. So in looking at that, okay, maybe, you know, thinking about the Russian stance, maybe Maxar is a US affiliated group, so it could be propaganda. Okay, what about Planet, separate satellite imagery organization? Let's cross-reference that. And we can see the same bodies on the ground in Planet satellite imagery as well. Aha, okay, I got you there. So double verification, and this is kind of important because if we think about that double verification standard, now we start to see the wave of attacks. So here's uh, one Russian government representative uh, banging on about how there were no corpses on the street, imagery is fake, and all fraudulent. 
Here's another Russian government representative on Sky News, um, no worries Sky, um, who started to speak about how satellite imagery was fraudulent and the satellite imagery couldn't have been from that date, couldn't have been from March 19, because there's some curious issues around Western government involvement and things like that. One of the points he actually pressed was it wasn't available on their website. And I was wondering, well, where did they get that information from? And then we started to see these blogs that were coming out from this fact-checking group called War on Fakes. Let me tell you, don't rely on that one if you see a fact-checking group called that, because it's not good. Anyway, so War on Fakes, uh -huh, really interesting. All these Russian government accounts are putting this out. Uh, the Embassy of Russia in Australia, woohoo. Um, the Embassy of Russia in New Zealand, God forbid, are putting these things out saying, don't believe or look at the global lies about Butcher. We have a look at this report. There's some interesting things in there. Um, and this is why I like to share techniques to investigative journalism groups and things like that because this is kind of important so you don't make a mock of yourself. So in the article, this fact-checking group, they basically said that there's no March 19 satellite imagery that New York Times relied upon because it's not shown on the Maxar website. Oh dear. Um, so if we have a look at this, okay, that's the satellite imagery on the right and they're denying that. So we have to go into overdrive to overprove this. But if we have a look at the Maxar website um, and we try and follow up their claim, uh, we can actually see that there is no March 19 satellite imagery, which is like, oh dear, okay, they're right. One thing that they forgot is that there's a little button at the top, I don't know if you can see that on the right, that says show all images. And if you click that, the Muppets forgot to actually click that and then it shows that there is March 19 satellite imagery. So just by this little oopsie daisy, the whole Russian government disinformation system has just kicked into overdrive spreading this without doing their own fact checking. And it's kind of nice to know how these techniques work so at least you can spot when they're used wrong as well. Um, they also tried to use shadows which just upped themselves basically uh, because they forgot to convert the time. So they said, oh no, this is taken an hour earlier. They didn't realize that this is actually taken on UTC time. Um, so that kind of stuff, right? Open source techniques are not just about verifying footage and showing it on the news. You can also use that to debunk propaganda. Um, and that was quite a useful one. So we've looked at where something has happened, the entire workflow of uh, Russia's full-scale invasion in February 2022. We've looked at where it's happened by looking at debunking Russia's attempts to saying when it's happened. And now I'm gonna take you through a case study on who is responsible and this kind of attribution work that we do a lot when we work with, say, for example, Ukrainian prosecutors. Um, so a lot of our work looks at mapping, for example, artillery strikes, rocket strikes. And this is something from Kharkiv in late February. It's actually a collaboration we did with CNN. Um, so bless you, CNN, for doing that. Um, and this is actually a collaboration we did where we looked at the use of cluster munitions in late February and early March in Kharkiv. And specifically what you're seeing on the left is right near a playground, actually. It's the cartridge tray of, uh, of, of a dispenser system. And you're seeing those multiple explosions on the right. That's how they look like in that footage from Kharkiv near a shopping mall. Um, this is CCTV footage that was uploaded online as well, where you can see people running away from those multiple explosions going off from cluster munitions. Now, these things are not fit for human consumption, and they're not fit for firing into suburban areas. They're bad and they're nasty. This is how they work. So this is a really nice uh, display that CNN made on how cluster munitions work, which is a nice visualization, actually, um, to explain how the kind of projectiles come out of that tray system. So we thought, OK, well, we've got impact sites where they're geolocated. Why don't we think about where it's coming from in order to start looking at attribution and identifying what commander might be responsible for that area? So again, by taking you through that same process and mass geolocating all that information, we're actually able to start drawing up firing lines. So where these impacts are happening as they drop these munitions over Kharkiv. And if you have a look at this, you've got straight firing lines from cluster munitions, which is quite interesting when you think about it. The payload's just dispensing on a highway almost. So if we zoom out a little bit more and have a look at the bigger picture, we can think, okay, well, where is this information coming from? And this is actually what the community was starting to work on. So Bellingcat did some work on this. We were doing some work. Amnesty was doing some work. And it was a whole collaborative effect to start working on verifying this information. Now, if we have a look from where, that, uh, where, where those areas or those white arrows were pointing from 
to have a look at potential firing positions. This is actually footage that was uploaded by a farmer in Western Russia near a place called Belgorod, where we see some funky clouds. I've got this one on mute because it's got heavy metal music in the background. I don't think you probably want to hear that. Um, so that's a pretty odd cloud that you see right there, actually. Uh, it's not a natural cloud. It's actually the firing of munitions, um, specifically rockets, towards Kharkiv. So by having a look at that sort of footage, we're thinking, OK, well, that's kind of interesting. And actually, someone from Bellingcat initially spotted this smoke plume coming from one of those areas as well. And this smoke plume is on planet satellite imagery, and it actually caught the time of launch. And that smoke plume launches towards Kharkiv. So you've got those evidence of those munitions being launched towards there from within Russia, mind you. This is over the border, inter-border firing. So this is a little bit dark on this screen, but using planet satellite imagery, we're able to follow up more of those locations to identify actually where these things are sitting in fields. And you can see burn marks. It's probably a little bit dark in this room. You can see burn marks on those fields right there, pointing towards Kharkiv. You can see burn marks there. It looks like someone's played golf, but a really big golf ball. Um, there and there and there. And that's quite interesting because we're actually able to work with CNN to identify units driving through there with closed source materials, not all open source, um, and accessing different groups to see who was moving around what location. And eventually identified that this Russian commander was responsible, Commander Zaravlov. Um, and he was in charge of an artillery brigade, actually. And he was the one that gave that permission to launch those cluster munitions into Kharkiv. And it's really interesting that we point this out because I talk about all this sexy OSINT data and cool satellite imagery and everyone's like, cool. But going back to the human story is quite important here. And there was an interesting case about Zaravlov is that he was also in Syria, in Aleppo in 2016, launching cluster munitions into Aleppo there. And with CNN, they were actually able to identify this surgeon on the left who was in Kharkiv treating people for cluster munitions. But he was also in Aleppo in 2016, peeping, treating people for cluster munitions as well. And he's treating patients from the injuries sustained by the same commander in two different countries for cluster munitions, which is pretty fascinating when you think about it. Great. So I've talked about the good side. or I mean, it's not good content, but it is good stuff. Um, but I want to talk about the risk of open source intelligence. I'm here standing in front of you talking about techniques that anyone can do from their couch or laptop. And there's a lot of people in this room that sit on their couch and do this stuff. But also there's people on the other side that do this as well. Um, so this is a nice little contribution to our NGO from a little volunteer organization of Belgian journalists. Um, they've never been to Ukraine. They've never heard of Ukraine prior to 2021. Um, but they got together with a group called GeoConfirmed, which is also just a group of hobby analysts. And they actually started to look at how open source is used by Russia, for example, to identify specific sites to target. And this is a really good community piece because it looks at how it can be used on the dark side as well. This is a video from Reddit. It was actually a video from uh, a Ukrainian journalist in Kyiv reporting on the Ukrainian military's good work of taking Russian tanks when they were seized, repairing them, and then taking them back into the battlefield as Ukrainian tanks. Really good story, right? Good PR stuff. Sadly, the footage was able to be geolocated. And it wasn't geolocated by us or any of the kind of good people on Twitter. It was actually geolocated by a group, uh, a Russian telegram group called Rybar, which is a very pro-Russian military group. And Rybar was able to geolocate this, put out coordinates, and actually identify the exact location of that factory in Kyiv. Uh, now that's interesting because as soon as they put those coordinates out, a day after, that site was struck and a number of Ukrainians were killed. So it shows that actually this happens on the other side as well. And then this inspired a rule from the Ukrainian government to stop filming of military sites because there is an indirect danger that journalists haven't been aware of until this strike happened. So if we think about that, it's quite interesting and there's a satellite imagery to show the targeting or or the destruction of that. Great, so I've shown you a couple of case studies to kind of visualize how these techniques are employed, how to answer where, when, and who, and what happened. But now I want to go through the data and the tools that we use quite regularly 
to maybe instill a little bit of information back to you guys and make this an informative session. Um, cool. So what data and tools do we have access to? I'm not going to cover them all. I think that's pretty much a five-day training program. I have a YouTube channel as well, which is about 20 hours worth of content covering them. Um, but we'll go through some really quick ones now. Uh, so obviously, we have access to news. Thanks, everyone here. Um, news is kind of important, right? Because if we think about it in the open source sense, using satellite imagery, digging up content on social media, there's a lot of interesting content that we can find. Um, but news is also awesome because there's groups that cover news systematically. They watch the journalists, they verify their activity, and they also give them coordinates. Does anyone use Accled here? Oh, a very small amount, and they're all OSINTERS up the back too. <laughs> Cheeky devils. Um, cool. So Accled is actually a platform that hires people to watch or read news uh, media articles and give them a coordinate setting. So if something happened in Kharkiv, give it coordinates, date, little indicator, and things like that, right? This is sick data when it's done over time, and it's done all across the world. So this is the data export tool for Accled. Um, and for example, on the way here, I actually made a little map from 2022 of Russian attributed explosions within eastern Ukraine. That simply, that took 30 minutes. So if you've got journos that are like, hey, let's visualize strikes, you could probably just use ACT really quickly. Um, and that's a tool that we like to use because we're thinking, okay, data is gold, data is storytelling, let's use this to show this information. Um, so yeah, Accolade's a really good one and I highly recommend you get onto that. Um, social media, obviously, is a banger and everyone's using it, especially journalists. Um, and using it for different reasons, some for amplification, some for monitoring. Um, obviously, social media comes with its qualms and there's thousands and thousands, if not tens of, tens of thousands of tools and more being made each day to find loopholes, to find new ways to scrape and things like that. Um, so on the left there, it's a little bit dark, but that's GitHub and it's a dark version, sorry. Um, there's a tool called the Bellingcat Archiver which essentially helps us because when we started our projects, for example, Myanmar, we'd enter something in the spreadsheet, we'd download the video and we'd save it on Google Drive somewhere. But now with this tool, you're able to enter something in the spreadsheet and it basically automatically captures footage, screenshot, text, everything like that. Really cool tool, freely available. Um, if those of you are using Telegram for monitoring uh, Ukraine, there's a no-code option to scrape information. I, I should call it collect because scraping's bad apparently. Um, to collect information. So if you use Telegram on your desktop, there's three little buttons at the top right which allows you to export the entire channel, including video content, including text content and photos. So if you don't want to revisit a really bad channel all the time, but you want to put it in CSV format and maybe control F for some keywords, just use that one. Uh, it's on all of your systems. You don't need to be a coder. Cool. Um, just on the social media thing, I thought I might point out as well, social media is a bit of a weapon these days. Uh, and I think it's why OSINT has become a little bit cool and edgy. Um, so for example, this group, which is uh, Oryx, so bless them, they've been using social media to track Ukrainian, uh, uh, Russian military losses of vehicles, right? Um, so much so that they've done it systematically on their little blog. And on the left, we have a screenshot from the UK Ministry of Defence, basically hat-tipping Oryx. So, these people that sit on the couch and do this kind of activity are now being used by UK military, US military for their open source benefit. So you can see the power of sitting on your, on your couch with a laptop, good internet connection and probably a lot of coffee. Um, great, and there's obviously other tools. So I went through the map that we have and then Bellingcat has a more niche map looking at uh, civilian harm as well for social media. Um, flight and maritime traffic data is really quite useful. So I don't know if any, any of you have used things like flight radar or marine traffic. Yeah, getting a couple of nods. Cool, well done. Um, you don't have to use it. You can also reach out to specialists who do that stuff as well. So I wanted to include this one to give a little hat tip to these people. Um, they're quite nerdy. So the guy on the left, Gerdion, really loves just watching planes uh, consistently. So he's also really happy to work with journalists. So if you have an issue, don't go to Flight Radar, probably just send him a DM and he's ready to respond. The guy on the right, Yuruk, um, is a good friend of mine and he actually just watches things on water. Um, specifically, he's now got a really cool camera so he can take nighttime videos and photos and he can take it of Russian vessels that are breaching sanctions, that are going through Turkish ports and things like that. He's very open to collaborations. Please work with him. He 
does this for a living. It's his hobby. Um, cool. So going into geospatial data, which is the stuff that everyone loves, and I'm conscious of time, I want to bang through this a little bit more. Um, so obviously crowdsourced data is quite cool, and a lot of people think, okay, well let's go to Google Maps and see what data we can get geospatially. Um, this is one called OpenStreetMap, and we actually had a conversation about it the other night. OpenStreetMap's cool, but it's kind of boring as well. But there's something better, <coughs> and I'm always about getting more access to data. Um, so this is one called Overpass Turbo, which is a bit of a kind of cool tool. Has anyone used that here? I think it's probably like, yay, cool, more people. Um, same people though. Uh, so Overpass Turbo is a really cool one because you don't have to be a coder, but what you can do is just put in a simple little function to pull data related to your query. So for example, I shouldn't be able to collect uh, infrastructure sites like power infrastructure sites in Ukraine. Nor should I be able to do that in Western Europe because it's probably a bit of a terrorism issue. So God forbid this is being filmed. Um, but if you do a pull for power infrastructure sites over that specific space, this is the data that you get. And that's data that's been crowdsourced from different data sets, different databases, and access data like that. Of course, I would mention that like any good person, if you get data from an unverified source, you should double check it. And you can do that by just bringing it into Google Earth and check it out each spot. Um, going on to the next one. Ooh, running out of battery. Uh, analytical. So analytical geospatial data sets are quite important for us. Um, obviously, there's a lot of people doing stuff around Ukraine, and I think it's nice to find the people that create tools for other people rather than just banging out tweets. So a really good one that we have is uh, Brady Afric, who's creating a, a Google My Maps thing. 10 minutes, awesome, cheers. Um, cool, so he's creating a Google My Maps thing and you can actually go to his account, it's at BradyFR. Um, he'll be really happy and excited that I had tipped him. Um, but basically what he's using is Sentinel Hub, which is low resolution imagery to track Russian fortifications. So you can see that little red line that he's created on that map on the left. That's Russian fortifications, that's the concrete teeth, so the counter barriers, the counter tank barriers as well. And he's doing all that work. Um, not too many journalists actually report on that kind of stuff, but there's a kind of cool story waiting to be cooked right there. Um, and he's very willing to w w talk with journos as well. So yeah, cool. Um, satellite sense data, so obviously, I mean, I think everyone's familiar with firms now, NASA firms, that kind of made a big bang recently. Uh, have people used NASA firms? Hey, more, cool, well done, Jane. Um, so NASA Firms is really helpful because it picks up heat signatures on the planet and really quite current heat signatures. So we use that for Myanmar a lot at the moment, tracking where villages are being burnt down at the moment. This is Bakhmut over the past four weeks and you can see that that just really picks out some of the activity that's been happening there of heat signatures. Mind you, I will just sort of forewarn you, you should always double check some of this stuff. So if you go to, for example, Lake Chad in Nigeria and you have a look at this stuff, because the water's really hot, it looks like a fire. It's not always on fire, it's just hot water or hot looking water. Um, cool, so that's NASA firms. With satellite imagery, obviously there's a few questions from a lot of people and a lot of editors want to know, how do I get good imagery? How do I get it quick? How do I get it for free? Um, so free high resolution imagery, Sorry, but you're kind of stuck with Google Earth, but you can still use it for geolocations, as I just showed you with that Russian soldier in Mariupol. Sure, a lot of Mariupol is destroyed, but at least the 2021 imagery is still quite cool. Um, but low resolution imagery is quite underutilized in news agencies. And this is a picture from Mariupol from March, um, showing the, 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 the fires. It's a little bit dark, actually. Uh, but showing the fires and also with a little bit of free banding, so no code banding, allowing you to bring out the fires like Christmas lights, essentially. Um, and that's quite underutilized, actually, because you're able to make time lapses and things like that. Um, but just because it's a bit of a foreign object, some people don't like to touch it. Um, obviously, paid high, resolu high resolution imagery. So Maxar has an email out at the moment. If you want to get on their press pack, you can just email them and they send you the updates. Um, Maxar doesn't provide... Uh, satellite imagery for Ukraine anymore publicly for subscriptions, so there's a little bit of a danger there. Um, but I can answer that off call, uh, sorry, not off call, off conference. Uh, <laughs> um, paid low resolution imagery, so obviously Planet is quite good for that one. We use Planet, 
uh, and they have a special NGO subscription rate. Um, you know, wh whether you want to work with that or not is up to you. They also do a lot of good deals with newsrooms. I think BBC has a BBC Africa. Um, cool tools. So uh, I wanted to kind of leave you with a couple of quick tools as well. So obviously I've already talked about Accled, Overpass Turbo. Um, for those of you interested in using machine learning tools and working with big data sets, this is quite useful. So this is Pinpoint Google. Uh, it's a new product. I'm not an ambassador for Google. Wish I could be. Um, but this is a really cool tool from Google that's been released to help small NGOs and small newsrooms uh, categorize data, essentially. What you're able to do is take a trove of PDFs and basically drop them in there. So I've scraped a heap of PDFs, like 57 of them, mentioning Russian names, sanctioned individuals, drop them in there. And on the right, you'll see that it categorizes them by people, by organizations, and by locations. So it kind of is an intern codifying all those PDFs for me, which is really useful. Um, that's Pinpoint Google. Google Sheets, uh, obviously we like to get dirty in the sheets, so they're quite useful. Um, but as you sort of heard with Bellingcat's tool, you're able to use that as an auto archiver to collect footage. Um, Chat GPT, everyone thinks it's a really cool thing. Uh, I think it's a little bit untrustworthy, so it's a little bit of a poorly paid intern. Um, but on the way here on the bus, I was reading this article, and I didn't want to read the whole thing. I just wanted to get all the usernames and people and places and descriptions out of it. So I took the link of this Open Democracy article. I'm sure it's a good article. You can read it if you want. Uh, didn't have time. So Jim Fitzpatrick wrote this, so well done, Jim. Uh, basically, I took the link for this, uh, and I gave it a request saying, extract all names from the report, create a CSV with columns for reference number, name, date, and a little bit of a description. Um, this is actually a, a prompt that was written by a colleague of mine, uh, Tom Jarvis, so you can follow him. He does a, little, a lot of little chat GPT prompt hacking, which is quite cool. Um, and basically, it spat out this result. Uh, so it went through the article and gave me all names, descriptions, and little user entity IDs as well, um, just in case you wanted to create like a network graph or anything like that. Um, but yeah, that's quite a cool one to use, and, it, and it's quite helpful. But I would also say with some of these... Uh, uh, implementations and automation um, that you should always double check it as well. Uh, so for example, I asked it to do a 500 word summary on every one of those people. It did it. It gave links as well, but still you should double check it because sometimes the names are wrong and things like that. Cool. Um, so why is this important? I'm wrapping up here. A couple of points. So obviously strengthening journalism and civil society. I've, yeah, I've done this at the BBC. Uh, I've done this in Bellingcat investigations and obviously with NGOs and CSOs uh, around the world. And I think this is really cool because these are some of the headlines we've been able to kick out since February 2022 to keep Ukraine alive, to keep this kind of hype in the media about what's happening and to keep that representation of what's happening on the ground to make sure that these stories get into the places that matter, especially susceptible communities. Um, so obviously it helps with justice and accountability, which is a lot of the work that we do, which is why I go to Kiev a lot. Um, we can show the evidence, not just tell it, kind of important, it's what I'm doing now. Um, but also going through things like fighting disinformation and propaganda, like I showed you with Butcher, verifying sources, and representation of victims and those affected. And I'm going to leave you with a, a video here. The audio is quite loud on this, guys, up the back, so please don't let it blast everyone out. Um, but representation of victims and those affected, this is something that's really important to me. That's what drives me to do all of this work, is while I've shown you sexy data, it's the people on the ground that matter, and this is why we do it. And this is a video that uh, was sent to me from uh, a person in Sudan in 2019 uh, when I was working at the BBC, when we were working on the pro-democratic protests. There's gunfire above, so you can't hear that, which is good, we don't want to trigger people. But basically, she's saying, they're playing, they're playing. And he says, let me record this and do this sign because we'll be able to show him when he lives in a democratic Sudan in the future and we'll be able to show this footage back to him as to what he's fighting for. And I think we're all fighting for the same thing in the same room, a better future for the next generation. Um, awesome. I'm Ben Strick. Thank you so much for giving me your time. Cool. Um, does anyone have any questions that they wanted me to revisit? I know I did some rapid talking there, so I promise I'll slow down now. Yeah, question up the back. Have you got the microphone people here? Take this one if you want. Oh, yeah. Hi, 
I was just wondering if you could um, remind us of the name of your um, Turkish colleague who, uh, you know, takes some photos of uh, ships and stuff passing through the Bosphorus. I didn't yeah. quite get it. <laughs> just type in the Bosphorus Observer. Bosphorus That's Observer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, his name is Yuruk. But Yuruk. yeah, Bosphorus Observer, you'll find him. Up the back. Hi, thanks. Yeah, that, that was a really interesting talk. I guess I'm left wondering, a lot of these databases where there's thousands of people contributing, like the one you showed at the beginning with the videos from Ukraine being verified, um, how do we know we can trust those people? Is anybody verifying their work? Yeah, that's a really good one, and it's something we struggle with a lot. So um, on this project specifically, we have uh, about 16 to 17 people focused on Ukraine alone, and they review a lot of the work that's submitted. So we work with Ukrainian NGOs, but we've basically uh, uh, international uh, groups and hobby volunteer groups. So we've had a number of groups that are Bellingcat volunteers that have also submitted to the database. But we give everyone the same approach, which is we're going to review every single entry to give it that kind of four-eye check. Um, and that's kind of crucial for us to put trust for us so we don't stuff up so that we're not susceptible to information operations, which we've been targeted with quite, requ uh, quite frequently, um, but also so that you can have some faith in that and hold us accountable if you find something incorrect or wrong or something that may seem a little bit off in the descriptions. So yeah, but um, it's a really good one. And honestly, I would just say review everything you use. So all the data in the world is pretty to have, but if you're gonna use it for a specific story, I'm sure your editors will always say, how can you trust this? Where did it come from? And that's kind of what I always think about in the back of my mind as well. That's probably the BBC mentality that was ingrained in me. <laughs> so uh, your work is super interesting and thank you for your talk, it was great. I'm just wondering, um, do you ever notice the disinformation on the Ukrainian side? Um, not as much, obviously. So I think significantly it has been Russian. Um, I think I haven't... No, I, so I will get around to disinformation. Um, I'd probably call it misinformation. So it's not intentional. So perhaps sometimes there's a video or there's a photo that's been shared that... And don't forget, we're in a war that's been brewing since 2014. So there's a lot of old videos out there. And maybe something's been shared from Kharkiv that's actually a little bit older. So I wouldn't call that intentional. Um, I think there's a difference between disinformation and strategic communications or propaganda or inf information operations. Um, I think at the moment a lot of those are quite successful because there's good marketing to show what's happening in Ukraine and that's important, right? Uh, but we haven't noticed the disinformation. It's definitely been uh, other states doing that um, and, and namely one. Any more questions from anyone? Oh, cool, we've got a cut. All right, thanks everyone. Cheers for your time. Thank you. Uh, I ask you to leave quickly the room because we have to sanitize everything and prepare for the next event. So thank you.